when I finally found out that like Vigil Game was kaput, it was pretty shocking. Like I had worked with a lot of those guys for years and years and years. Um, we made Dark Shadows one, two. I mean, some of those guys I'd worked on prior to even Vigil. Like we'd worked at um, NCSoft together and we worked together at another place called Realm Interactive before that. And for me, it was it's like a big shock because in my head it was like I'm just gonna work with these guys for the rest forever, right? That's my whole game career. So. I was kind of sitting there going, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Like, I actually had no idea what I was going to do. And it was interesting, too, because I was the general manager at Vigil. And at that point, they were like, well, I guess we've gone through some layoffs. But at its peak, there were like 250 people. The closure at uh, Vigil Games was kind of a surprise to everybody on the team. Um, well, obviously, like THQ was a huge company. There's a lot of comp there was a lot of um, development studios underneath the umbrella. Um, and we all thought we were going to go kind of together into this new, new uh, venture. Um, but then this, the auction happened and it didn't go the way we expected. Uh, and then we got word back at the studio that pretty much everyone had been picked up except Vigil Games. And so that was a big shock, like really, uh, for all of us there. We'd been under the impression that everything was going to be fine. Initially, um, when we had heard that uh, Darksiders, the franchise, had gotten picked up, but the actual studio did not get, you know, didn't have any bidders for it. And so we were all like very... Uh, it was very uh, surreal, like you're just sitting there and you've worked with these people for years and now just sitting there, what do we do, what happens, you know, and so I think there was a bit, a bit of, uh, of, you know, unknown or uncertainty. And then <clears throat> I was talking to David and uh, he had indicated that uh, Crytek had reached out to them and it was kind of weird and it was, uh, you know, like a last minute kind of thing, not for the actual uh, uh, assets, but they were surprised that no one had, had bid on the studio. And so um, in, con in talking with them and the Yearlies, and uh, with Crytek, they wanted to move it really qu relatively quickly, and so we kind of uh, got together and started talking about what would that look like. They wanted to start a uh, studio in America, uh, so it seemed like a good fit, uh, they, they thought at least, and we were up for the challenge of, uh, of working for Crytek. So we ended up, um, a portion of the team got picked up by Crytek, and we became Crytek USA. It was really just a, uh, a, a maelstrom of feelings and you know you you had this uh, hey you, you you were out of vigil and what this meant and then these new opportunities with Crytek you know because at that time Crytek had you know several studios they had probably had six or seven studios already all over the place they, they had you know AAA titles that they had released there and, and you know had their own engine all these other kind of things and so <clears throat> the opportunity seemed like such a how fortunate you know we didn't get picked up like this way but we're moving on to the next chapter of our lives and it seems like it, we won't miss a beat. We have, you know, a core constituency of, of people that we were able to retain from Vigil and so uh, we moved forward into Crytek USA. That, for me, that was the cool part about the whole Crytek thing is it allowed us to kind of transition a lot of those people that we'd worked together for a long time and stay, be able to stay together at the end of the day and it didn't really matter what we're working on or who are we doing it for or any of that kind of stuff. For us, it was, and at least me personally, it was just more important to be able to continue to work together. Crytek was very cool about whatever you guys want. We, we brought you on because of the creative talent that you guys had. And so uh, while we are looking at uh, possibly getting into the free-to-play space, we're interested in your ideas. And so we had come up with a, a, a kind of like a dungeon crawler idea um, and started talking about maybe making it episodic or mission-based kind of component. And so the idea from Hunt uh, really spurned from, hey, we really like co-op multiplayer games. Uh, what's an interesting type of time frame? Where's the time period? And so we started talking about in the late 1800s uh, uh, in a time in the world where it was very, um, there was just so many things happening. You know, electricity was barely coming online, different inventions. There was no rules or regulations for anything that we now take, you know, for granted kind of. And so, you know, when you had people just stretching lines of cable across, you know, building to building to have lights or, or you still had this idea that there were people that were, that lights weren't prevalent everywhere, that darkness really ma mattered and you had lanterns that would turn on and gas and you had all these other things, kerosene was coming on, you know, there was just a, a whole bunch of stuff happening at that particular time frame that we thought we were very intrigued by that. And so we kind of uh, spun the tale of what if you were monster hunters in that area? And these things that we've always heard of that were, uh, um, you know, in the bat, you know, Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster, these were real things, but you had to kind of source or find those out. And so Hunt, the horrors of the Gilded Age kind of uh, started like that. Hunt uh, Horrors of the Gilded Age definitely was a very different game for us, being a, like a third-person shooter co-op experience. Um, but the, it ha definitely had a lot of the elements, um, big focus on boss fights. Um, obviously, like Darksiders 1 and 2 were very heavy, cool, dark 
Darksiders-ish, I don't even know what to call them at this point, like Darksiders' boss fights, these big boss fights, these over-to-the-top uh, moments, um, a lot of that carried over into Hunt. Um, we'd done, I think at the time when we closed, we had like maybe three to four bosses in progress and they were all pretty different than um, each other. They were pretty unique experiences. So I think that was one of the big key elements um, and just kind of the world building, I think was the other big part of it for us. Like we're big into building exciting, cool, just lived in worlds. And um, I think we really accomplished that with what we did with the hunt as well. Being able to have one uh, protagonist is really interesting and being able to weave a, a linear tale and kind of put people, obviously Darksiders 2 was much more open open world than Darksiders 1 was, but I think for us the, the co-op fun was always you know in the forefront. There were a lot of folks who just play those games who just really gravitate toward those kind of uh, games and that was a fun element for us. And I think the ability to have creatures in a gun battle kind of uh, and then be able to tie in that mythical that mystical piece to it you know where we had started just going down the road of a cult and how does that operate and how does magic blend itself into this world because obviously we're fighting these mythical creatures how does that all tie together and I think for us that was the very alluring and interesting part for the hunt horse of the Gilded Age part. Yeah I, I think um, I think I think walking away from hunt was probably um, a very just a difficult thing in general um, there was a lot of a lot of work in there. There was a lot of passion we put into that game. We had figured out a lot and we accomplished a lot in a year. Um, end of the day, it just made sense that we kind of had to for the, for t we wanted, bigger than any game, I, we really wanted to keep the team together. And then that looked like the only viable option as a way to do that of like, to walk away from it. The thing is when you work in games like you build a pretty big camaraderie because, I mean, ultimately a game is a creative thing, right? Like, and you're in this weird situation where you have to create things together and critique each other's work, and you do a lot of weird, sensitive, emotional things. It doesn't make sense, but like, you know, when you when you create something and someone tells you that's terrible, that actually sucks. The most stalwart individual on the face of the earth will be affected by that because it, it hurts, right? Because it's something you built, even if it's true, even if you're like, damn it, they're right, this does suck. And I think that that kind of like, that back and forth and the, the relationships you build doing that um, makes for pretty tight-knit groups. And that's why I think you'll see in a lot of cases that in the industry, like there are groups of people that kind of move together. Like one guy will leave and go to a new studio and then suddenly like like six or seven more people show up because they just like working together. And when you find a group of people that you like to work together with and you communicate well with each other and you don't annoy each other, it's, it's something you want to try to keep together. Well, I think if you look back, uh, when we first started the studio, we uh, were just being scrappy and just trying to say we had done some uh, engine work with Amazon. We had done uh, a little uh, uh, mobile game uh, with Oculus. Um, Jason Rubin uh, kind of partnered up with us and said, hey, if you guys got some bandwidth, I know you just opened a new studio. We're looking to try to add a little content to this mobile thing. It's not necessarily your space, but why don't you come out here and take a look at it? And so we went out and took a look at uh, this mobile VR. I mean, you know, we had never seen anything like that and went up to Dallas with uh, John Carmack and his team. And it was amazing. It was just like, wow, you know, this is so crazy. We've never seen, you know, the Gear VR or anything like that. And then they took us and showed us the Oculus Rift and what they were planning on doing and all these other kind of things. And so it was very intriguing to be in that space. And then, uh, and uh, the other thing was, is that we had, we were working on engine uh, work, we were doing the port, and we were going to, uh, this sounded like, again, just something to get our feet wet as we were still establishing what we were trying to do and how big we wanted. You know, there's a lot of things that, uh, starting a studio that you just are like, okay, we started it, we've got some money, uh, what do we want to do now? Like, you know, like, let's, let's figure that out so we have a good, strong base. And so we did this uh, small little port called Herobound, and uh, they liked it so much, and the content we did for their release for the, for the phone, they decided they wanted to do a bigger version uh, for the Rift and for the phone. It called it uh, Hero Bound Spirit Champion, I think it's uh, on the very end there. It's the same kind of little guy. It was uh, Oculus Studio titles. They have uh, two great guys to work with, Andrew and Ryan from Oculus there that we kind of partnered up with. And we basically took that small title and, and exploded it into, you know, four bosses and, uh, you know, actually yeah, four main bosses, uh, about 10 hours worth of content for the phone. We really enjoyed it. It was working in Unity. We had never worked in that before. So making a phone title and a phone port, we kind of started working in that. And then uh, Oculus, the relationship just kind of bloomed from there. And it was really like, hey, we'd like you guys to set, figure out a game that could be done within a year for launch. Um, what are you guys' ideas?
Tonight, I speak to you the tale. Um, Cronus was an uh, attempt to make like a cool action-adventure game in VR, and I, it really came from a pro We were just prototyping a bunch of camera stuff, because especially really, really on, on in VR, like there was a lot of um, sensitivity around making people motion sick. And there's a lot more work has been done since then, but this was like rewind, blah, 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 blah. and when I say rewind, it was like, what, two years ago? But in like VR time, that's like a thousand years. But at the time, there was a lot of like, what about this, what about that, what can we do to try to make comfortable experiences? Because you, the last thing you want is someone's first experience in VR to be nauseating. Um, and so we had just done this, we we're like, hey, let's just try something like Resident Evil. Like it's a fixed camera, um, and is, if the camera doesn't move without your control, if you can move your head, that's fine, but as long as the camera's not moving, like almost everybody's comfortable. And so our goal is to make, we want to make a game where almost everybody's comfortable. And we didn't even know what game we were going to make. We are just like, let's just try the camera. We had come up with this idea of like, what if we just did these in vignettes, kind of like what we did in Herobound, only a bigger, where you can get the camera a little bit closer. And uh, you basically come in from one way, come out from the other, and you kind of have these experiences and you just keep going, you know, think, think, think as you're going along. And so we really wanted to make something very atmospheric. We really wanted to play on the immersion factor of VR. The idea of looking up and the scale and the sense of you know those kind of pieces and so we really uh, started kind of from that avenue and just did some concept work some ideas and but hit the ground running because we had to get you know up to speed and so we decided at that point uh, come March or April we were just going to do Unreal and so we got into Unreal this was the first time we worked in Unreal so it was just all these kind of like beats as we went along for Kronos and that's kind of uh, where we said you know let's do these vignettes in this idea where you know you start out as a young teenager and then you grow along with the game and every time you die you kind of get kicked back out of the matrix and uh, you are uh, uh, you know you you age and you see yourself visually age and you and you your stats now kind of physically change and the way that you leveled up and everything and so we kind of went through down that road to, to come to Kronos but we had to do it in a relatively quick amount of time and so the idea what we were shooting for was about four to six hours worth of gameplay and I think we finished up with about eight to ten you know possibly twelve hours depending on how, how well you play the game. Kronos was a very um, similar game to what we'd done before um, but it was a much more of a subdued version of like a Darksiders game where Darksiders is over the top action, stylish action if that's still a genre anymore. Um, Whereas Kronos was a much more quieter, moment to moment, um, every battle could be your last kind of thing. Um, it still carried on a lot of the th the lessons we learned in Darksiders, the combat, the pacing, uh, all very much like Darksiders, but a, a, a little bit slower paced, a little bit more punishing. Um, and being in VR, it was it was a chance to try something new. And that was probably the most exciting thing was we were able to make a, a VR launch game for the Oculus Rift, um, which obviously was a very, very new platform at the time. It was the launch title, so it was it was really cool to be able to get in on the ground floor with something like that. Uh, the early prototype of Kronos was remarkably like the finished game. Our first prototype was um, in Kronos. There's a tower where you kill a cyclops, and we had kind of done like the first, I guess, third of that tower. And I think that it was cool because there was a defining moment where like I love cool giant bosses and stuff in games, and it was really cool when the cyclops actually walked up to you to stop on you. And like it's, it was the first time you get a true sense of scale of some of this stuff. Like you're actually staring up at this giant, like 90 foot tall cyclops. And that's something that's uniquely VR. Like you, it doesn't matter how big you make a creature on a normal, in a normal game. You could be playing Shadow Colossus where the guy's like a billion feet tall. I mean, sure it looks big, I guess, but you don't really get a sense of true scale. And that's something you can only really get in VR, which was really cool. But yeah, the prototype was remarkably like the final game, which is surprising, that rarely happens. <laughs> You know, our mantra was the safest experience, the most comfortable experience. We really wanted to show, by, but still highlight or showcase VR. And so from us, it was more of this, become the director. You're framing the shot, you're in the director chair, and you're, seeing, you're able to guide the action. And how does that look in each little set, in each little room we do you? And we really, you, you came up with these rules, like if I come from this end, the next shot should have me still orientated to that, looking that same way. So it's not like I'm looking here and then I shot and all of a sudden my head snapped to this way or and these other pieces. And while I think we did a, a really good job with most of those things, there's still some elements we could you know, tidy up, I think. But at the end of the day, it became a very storytelling and, and exciting experience because you really felt like I'm the director in the, in the, in the game. I'm the person who's you know, doing these shots and doing, if I want to fight closer to the camera, I can. If I want to fight farther away, I can. And the idea of scale and immersiveness even if it was a third person, you know, where the camera's not moving like you see now, 
it was still added that atmospheric piece that it were like, where I really felt like if I looked down, wow, there's there's that added dimension. If I look up, the scale of the you know the cyclops is giant. And so for us, moving towards that, it was just the you know these little blue figures that we initially had put on just to play with cameras, and and it was uh, very very rudimentary. But we had to get it up to speed fast because <laughs> we only had you know like ten months to get it done. Yeah, the. Uh... I think the biggest challenge uh, from a design perspective on Kronos was um, just making sure that the the world read, that this combat read, uh, puzzles were readable, because it was a stationary camera system, much like like a Resident Evil, um, an old school Resident Evil, um, where it went, you went from camera to camera. Um, it, it always had to keep the action in view, um, and it always had to set up um, the next scene so that you weren't lost. Uh, that was probably one of the bigger challenges. That and to the technical challenge of running at 90 frames a second for uh, and trying to create this this big expansive world. Um, they definitely were the bigger challenges we faced on Chronos. Yeah, it's definitely like very reminiscent of the type of games we made, right? Like there was cool creatures. Like again, every game I, I like to make cool exploration, interesting creatures, awesome bosses, some sort of like puzzles, thinking type stuff. And Chronos had all that stuff. It wasn't like Darksiders, but it had its own version of all that stuff. But it was definitely. You know, and again, because we only had 11 months, we're like, hey, let's make something we know. We know this. We know how to make a game like this. And so that's why we did it. Uh, you know, I think that you know, with every project you have, you know, different little things that were laughable or, or humorous. And I think in the early exploring of uh, the, um, the boss fights and fine tuning them, we had uh, several people who couldn't beat the Cyclops. Um, like just go through and just beat the Cyclops from a from a play perspective, you know, like just it's too hard, you know, because we really tried to do um, a, a you know I'll call it a Souls light kind of experience with combat, but that was one of the the most playful things is when people couldn't beat a boss or get past a certain area because they just weren't familiar with those kind of games or they just didn't want to practice enough, and so that was a quite jovial to hear, you know, somebody say, "When we're never going to get past the first boss," or you know, "I couldn't beat this guy," or, and and have those kind of dialogues and the, those funny type of like moments when you're like, "Okay, do we need to fine tune him?" No, he just sucks, you know. He just needs to get better at the game, you know, get good. And so I think those are still highlighted moments for us. I, I think we're very proud with the amount of time we had and and the budget that the of how Chronos turned out, and it really uh, was an exciting project for us. With, uh, with, with Kronos, we, we were actually pretty chill in the studio. Um, I think it was uh, actually when we worked on Dead and Buried um, is when we started breaking TVs. Um, I, we, I think we've lost three TVs at this point, uh, mostly to trying to throw dynamite. Um, so that was, that was pretty funny. Uh, but I think uh, that, was, that was when we started getting way more uh, uh, active with our VR games. We had to buy we had to buy uh, covers for the TVs to protect them from uh, from future assault. Oh, people would jump. There was a there was one sequence where like the the, the big cyclops you'd walk in a room and then it would like bust in the room and like reach out and grab you. And it was fun to watch people because it kind of came from your peripheral vision because you came in the room this way and you'd be kind of looking this way and you see them go blah and they'd jump back and. I think that like someone will actually make a VR game someday that'll give someone a heart attack. Pro <laughs> Oculus probably doesn't want me to say that for liability reasons, and it's probably not true. Legally, it's not true. But <laughs> Definitely it, not in our game. it's amazing the level, the potential you have to like invoke real emotion in VR because it feels so true and so real and immersive. Yeah, it was uh, one of the the uh, well received title from a launch titles perspective. We had uh, quite a number of people doing reviews on it. I think that. Um, it was one of the higher reviewed games at, uh, from Oculus at the time. It's still one of considered, uh, you know, if you can say, you know, within the last couple of years or however long VR is around, that's a, it's a, a more of a classic type of game and experience from for VR. Then I would absolutely think that. I think we won uh, best VR game of the year from Game Informer. Um, so it's uh, it's a, been a very solid title and and one that is. Again, you're, 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 you work on a lot of titles and has we, the fun that we've had on Darksiders or you know, some of the ones that didn't get shipped and Kronos was a, a special first project you know, under the gun kind of. And what was fun, funny with it was it wasn't as stressful as one would think, you know, being in the industry and oh, everybody's crunching and everything. We, we hardly did any of that on Kronos. You know, it, was well, it was well scoped. Uh, we kept things uh, very tight in terms of the, the mechanics of what we wanted to do and really just kind of thought about uh, you know, keeping the end user experience as a uh, an interesting one. I'm super proud of Kronos because like we made that game in like 11 months and I think most people who played the game to completion would probably not believe we made that game in 11 months but we actually did and it wasn't even that many people and uh, we actually signed the deal with Oculus and I think like six weeks later we showed it at E3 
And again, that's a testament to how quick the team worked. Like we were able to put together a whole level of the game with a cool boss and all this stuff in six weeks. And uh, it, it was a really special project, I think, because it, it was one of those projects where like everything just kind of worked. We didn't struggle a lot. We all worked really well together. Um, and the game turned out really, really great. And we were all super proud of it. So I, I'm really proud of that game, that, both the way it was made and the way it turned out. Yeah, From Other Sons was definitely uh, probably our most challenging game to date. Um, it was full locomotion, touch controls, and multiplayer. Um, and from a from an Oculus uh, publishing perspective, this was, that was their first game like that. Um, so it was it was definitely a lot of firsts, and it was very challenging, um, keeping the frame rate consistent, uh, making sure that people were matching correctly with the games and keeping synced. Um, there was just a lot of uh, stuff going on with uh, like IK, um, keeping the characters like where they need to be, um, but also, I mean, you have all that on top of making a fun game. Um, so it, it definitely was a different game than we'd done previously, but it had a lot of the same, kind of same elements. It was big, we were big into the world building, trying to set up a really interesting world that the player could, could live and play in. Um, it's in terms of like high level stuff, it's very much a rogue light where um, you know you, you play a little bit, you fail, start over, play a little bit more, fail, start over. Uh, we're very inspired by like Rogue Legacy or like an FTL, um, especially with that game. Yeah, I think I mean from Other Sons was like the impetus was that for that was, and I love Star Trek and Firefly and like huge sci-fi nerd. So the idea of like, hey, here's an entire interactive spaceship and you're in command and you can do whatever you want. That was kind of the initial dream because we were also trying to think of like, what can we do that's more immersive than Kronos? Because Kronos was, you were sort of like a third person omniscient observer. You weren't the actual character in the game. You saw the character in the game moving around. And so we're like, hey, what's something that's more personal, more immersive? And I just wanted to make a game like Star Trek where you just jumped in a starship and jumped around and had cool adventures. And that was really the, the fundamental um, idea behind the game. And then on top of that, we just wanted to do co-op. Like we've been wanting to do co-op and that's really a way we want to push the studio in general. And so it was like, hey, let's, Oculus wants to work with us. This is the kind of game we want to make. They were super cool about it. They're like, yeah, whatever you guys want to do. Because we've done really well on Kronos. And so we decided to make that game and um, it kind of just grew from there. You know, we added a random dungeon. We did, I mean, the game, it originally you weren't even gonna leave the bridge. It was like, you're just on a bridge commanding your starship. We ended up like, you can run around the full ship, you can board alien ships, you can, go on space stations and fight robots and aliens with guns and it, like it started like this and it became this but um, it was definitely an interesting ride. We have a bad problem with that, Shoot. adding features to games, should probably work on that. Shoot. And so we really took uh, our initial pitch and kind of morphed it into that where it was, hey you have these FTL experiences and how you're moving guys and, and repairing and, 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 and system resource management and we layered on uh, first person shooting and so for us that was really compelling because we had never done anything like that before. Uh, we had worked in touch and, and actually helped ship Dead and Buried and did a lot of content for that. Uh, so that was on our minds when we were getting right, when we were working on From of the Suns because we knew we still had almost a year to continue working on it, that we were looking at Dead and Buried. And even though it was in a different engine, we, we kind of got some ideas on what we want to do and reloads and how that stuff works. And so when we started coming on board with, uh, with uh, From of the Suns, it was really a, hey, this is a co-op shooter. You know, this has much more Borderlands kind of influence to it where you're going, you're getting loot, you're shooting guys, you know, you're upgrading your, your, your uh, guns, you're continuing to do that throughout the whole story. And I think from our perspective, we went and said, this is a really cool, neat experience as well. And it's something that hasn't been done yet in a multiplayer space on NVR from, a, from an Oculus standpoint, from a studio standpoint. And so that was the next layer for us. And so that's kind of how we got to From Other Suns and its current, its current iteration. Like I said, the first prototype was like, you're just on the bridge, like, doing, uh, and it turns out Star Trek did that with the bridge commander, right? Like, you just control everything from the bridge, and that's actually a really cool game, and I think it could have been a cool game, but, like, again, getting back to, like, no, I want the full, complete space adventure. I want to be able to do anything. I want to be able to run to the engine room because the engines are broken and repair it, or repair a hull breach, or, you know, beam aboard weird alien ships and do all kinds of crazy stuff, and that's ultimately, like, we, we didn't make the ultimate version of that yet, but I think we made 
a portion of the ultimate version of that. <laughs> and I would still like to make the ultimate version of that someday. That'd be really cool. When you think about a first person shooter, the one thing that you think of is what makes it compelling? You know, guys on the screen being able to be blasted and shooting, you see the guns, you see the effects, you know, the, the environment, you're, it's much more visceral. And so for us, we went and it, we initially thought about doing four players and there was just not enough, you could, didn't have enough bandwidth to be able to put enough guys on the screen and make everything look cool to the standards that we expected from ourselves and have it run. And so with the min spec machines that Oculus was saying, hey, this is what we have to do, we really wanted to push that um, with, with our title. And so we went down to three people. Uh, we kind of started building for three people and, uh, and start having, you know, okay, can we get enough guys on the screen to make things fun for three people? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, do we do two people, do we know? And we thought three was a good, uh, a good metric for a co-op game. And we thought that this will be um, fun to get three people together and have the zany adventures of, you know, the things that can just happen in, in, in an environment to where you have a lot of fun in those, those water cooler moments where you're sitting there going, hey, remember when you left me on that planet and you, know, you went to the next thing and I just died and now you know, we gave, came up with all these type of different mechanics to, to in, have that co-op feel really be there. And so in order to make it challenging for three players, you have to ramp up the number of enemies and suddenly all that escalation of multiplayer just puts a lot more burden on um, being able to make the game actually run. And then there, is, there were other design challenges as far as like, okay, if you're in a space fight, how do you make it fun for three players if one guy's on the bridge controlling everything? Um, but honestly, I don't think that was as hard to solve. And it sounds kind of weird to say that the biggest challenge was performance, but ultimately at the end of the day, that was, from a multiplayer perspective, one of the bigger challenges. Hmm, maybe this'll help. It's the type of game where just weird shenanigans happen. Like, just as a prime example, you could be fighting an enemy ship, someone could run over the ship, and then you could blow it up while they're on that ship. There's nothing about the game that stops you from doing that. In fact, you could set your weapons to auto-fire, so the computer's just firing at the other ship, board the other ship, and blow yourself up. And so it's just the kind of game that weird stuff like that, could, there's friendly fire in the game. Like, we're like, here's a situation, we give you natural world rules, and you can kill each other and blow each other up and do whatever you want and we're not going to stop you. And that automatically creates some, for some crazy stuff. And I think we just had a lot of fun. I mean, of course, the first time you put Friendly Fire in, the immediately afterwards, the first PlayStation, is everybody just ends up killing each other. You're like, oh wait, Friendly Fire's on. And then it just turns into a firefight and no one can actually get anything done. Or the first time you figure out you can blow someone else up while they board another ship. Or, so, or throw a grenade at someone's feet and then run away and watch them blow up. Like, um, we had a lot of fun with that. We just had a lot of fun playing the game just because a lot of cool, wacky stuff like that could happen. Uh, one of the things that you look at from a physical standpoint, actually putting on a headset, whether we were working with Kronos on a controller or with the touch controllers, that automatically becomes a different physical way you develop because now you're looking down a, a, a nudge, you're trying to okay, I'm pushing this button, I'm seeing what I'm doing, I'm taking this off, I'm, I'm working on it, I'm putting this back on, I'm looking through this. Uh, and testing and iterating is a whole different process. And a lot, oftentimes, folks weren't even comfortable in the headset. So you'd have this, this piece where, you know, you're, you're fighting against trying to develop, you know, like this game, and you're like, I can't even go in the headset and move around too much because you'd still have these times where a panel would stick or there'd just be, you know, a bug or something, and it would just be almost immediate kind of uh, um, uh, uncomfortable. And then you take the headset off and you're like, look, when I got it, I need 30 minutes to rest, you know, and you, you don't get that in normal development. You, you know, you're, everybody's used to working on a computer screen and working on that. So I think physically that was one of the first pieces. The, the second piece is coming together and uh, learning the limitations in terms of what performance you need to have a comfortable experience versus what you're able to get away with on a normal PC and a normal console. And I think while the consoles have limitations, they're much less stringent than the metrics that Oculus has set up to make sure that, you, that the end user has a comfortable experience at the end of the day. And I think that for us was a big challenge because you come from this you know, AAA blockbuster uh, budgets where you can just have all the VFX and you got everything rolling and cinematics and everything. And now you're in a, in a world where you can't control the camera because the person's looking all over. You're uh, limited by what you can put on the screen because you can't get 90 frames a second in each eye. You know, there's just a lot of challenges just from a technical standpoint of getting things operational, especially, you know, not working in the engine, not working in this and, and learning those things, you know, learning, hey, this was uncomfortable for us and, and the iterations we went to with what kind of camera were we going to use in Kronos? You know, what camera what kind of camera did we want to try out in Boss? Those were all new things that we had. You never, you don't have to worry about that. That's all we already been established in, in millions of games that have been developed for both console and PC. So, 
it was a, a exciting frontier, but at the same time challenging because what could you get away with? What didn't you know? You know, does this make people sick? Oh, wow, it does make a lot of people sick. You know, like th those kind of pieces, you know, you just never, you never thought of when you were first going into it. And then you just start kind of learning as you go along. It's definitely really hard to market a VR game because, again, until you've actually had a VR headset on and you've seen what it means, it's really hard to explain. It's like actually impossible to explain to somebody. <laughs> you could even say all the, the the obvious stuff, like it's like you're actually there and you can see things and you can touch things. And people are like, okay, okay. <laughs> Until they actually put the headset on, they're like, oh wow, this is amazing. But uh, I think it's funny because I don't remember if this happened maybe after Cronus or whatever. And I think the first people started saying, hey, let's do this mixed reality thing where they would like show an actual person inside the 3D world. And that's probably the best way they're ever going to have to be able to truly show what the, but even that it doesn't actually fully describe and I think that is a challenge for VR headset makers and that's why you see all those demo stations in like every Best Buy and they're doing as much as they can because once you've seen it you're good because once you've seen it and you see footage you can mentally extrapolate what it's going to be like in VR but you need that first experience to really know what it is and I think as more and more headset gets out there and they get cheaper and they got like you know they try to do the Google Cardboard thing you know as a, an attempt to like hey you can just build yourself and kind of see but like there's an interest in seeing like a mediocre VR experience and an actual really good VR experience. And I think the challenge is getting people to experience the actual high quality VR experience. I mean, I bought a viewfinder from Target, which was like viewfinder VR, which without insulting viewfinder wasn't the greatest VR experience on the face of the earth. But I imagine a bunch of kids like trying viewfinder VR going, this is garbage. I don't want to play VR. So there's definitely a challenge there about as far as no, actually, there's really cool VR. You just need to actually see it to know what it is. Oh, yeah. Oculus has been a great partner. I think the, the biggest thing for us was, uh, you know, we wanted to um, come on board, and we had kind of gotten spoiled at Crytek a little bit because, again, Crytek was very good from a creative process. They let us do whatever we wanted. Whatever pieces we wanted to do, they were very on board with in terms of, like, hey, you know, you guys have been developing games. You know what to do. And so moving into the Oculus uh, uh, realm as well, outside of the restrictions that they wanted to do from a end user's perspective that we would never have known about, they were great partners. You know, they said, hey, come up with an IP, we'll support you guys, this is cool, here's our feedback, here's what we think, you know, but take whatever you want to do. And I think from that from that avenue going forward, it was a very, re really a special relationship with us. And I think it's been just, uh, you know, such a great partnership from our perspective that they've really given us a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, ways to explore this new space of way to tell stories. And I think with Oculus, they were, you know, this was a new medium, a new platform. And so coming on board, nobody knew what the expectations were. And I think Oculus saying, look, we have to fund titles, we have to fund these pieces and give some type of reason for developers to do that because there isn't an ecosystem. There isn't 40 million, 50 million, 100 million headsets out there yet. And so I think from that perspective, that's that was their take on on looking forward for generating content. Darksiders 3 development has been quite different um, than our previous Darksiders games. Uh, Darksiders 1, it was very much a time of, of, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that game was. Um, you know, what was, you know, what was the lore, what was the world, what was the gameplay, what was the combat. Um, most of the time was spent early on doing that. Um, with Darksiders 2, we kind of knew that stuff, but then we wanted to make a bigger game. So that meant we had to get a bigger team, and we also had to support kind of this, the team that was coming off of Darksiders 1, so we kind of jumped right into production. We had a little bit of pre-production time at the end of Darksiders 1, but it still wasn't ideal. Um, with Darksiders 3, we actually got what we talked about since the days of Darksiders 1, which was a good, true pre-production. Um, and that's been really, I think it's been great for the project. It's actually made it smoother than the previous two games from a, from a, from a development standpoint. It's, um, it's meant we spent a lot of time concepting um, up front. We spent a lot of time figuring out what Fury can and can't do, um, setting our metrics early on. Um, we kind of started every project with, hey, here's some metrics, but we quickly broke them as we got into the game. Uh, with this one, we were actually able to, to, to kind of hone them in and stick to them, and I think that's been probably the best uh, thing for this game, because we don't spend any time asking, well, what is this or what is that? We know what it is, and we can just focus on making the game. When we started talking about it, you know, we were like, okay, can we fit this in? With, because you know, traditionally we wanted to go with our own IPs. We were working towards our own IPs. We learned some PC console and also the VR angle we wanted to. And so Darksiders was a, a, hey, should we do this? And if we do this, 
it's not our own IP, but we're excited about the franchise. I mean, it's it, it, it's our home. You know, it's 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 what we started out with. Vigil. You know, Dave, one of the core founders of the game. You know, basically, you know, writing the script and just the whole the whole idea of of seeing that to fruition. Um, it, you come back and it's familiar, and I think that we had taken enough time off to come back and make it familiar, and 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 you understand how to make the game. You understand that that what what made it special in the beginning, and I think. The studio is quite excited by that. You know, it's a big title for us. It's not our own IP. You know, people, while we had so much great time on Kronos or from Other Sons or, or any of our other titles, um, it's this is a big project for us because a lot of people know about the project. And a lot of people, there's a lot of fans out there that have high expectations. And we want to make sure we hit those expectations. And I think that's good for us as a studio because we still have that traditional AAA title experience and, and where we want to play at and what, and what space we want to be at. We have a much better sense of what we want to build and we have a much better way of going about that. It doesn't mean we don't change stuff or reiterate or try new stuff, but I think we've gotten a lot better of like, hey, this isn't working, move on. This isn't working, move on. Whereas in the past, I think you tend to hold on stuff too long. Like everybody knows it's not working and it takes you like four months to admit it. That's like the death of video game development. Um, so we've kind of gotten to that point where like literally the nanosecond we know something's not working, we're like, all right, hold the presses, let's try something else. And I think that's, hopefully will result in us wasting a lot less time and will result in a better project. We want to make sure that it's a evolution of the title in terms of uh, you continue to explore the story and explore, you know, the four horsemen's journey and you know this specific horse, horse woman, uh, Fury, and what she's going to be doing and, and her role as a protagonist and how that intertwines with her brothers. I think is quite compelling and, and very interesting. And I think we've got a lot of uh, different mechanics that will shine through, uh, that will make her unique you know, compared to the other the others as well, just like Death and War were unique. While you still have the, uh, the, the pieces that hold dear to Darksiders, you still want to explore and expound upon that gameplay and that universe and how that all intertwines and, and keep it modern and, and fresh and a different perspective. And, and changing the protagonist is always a challenge because, of, you know, uh, War was very, you know, hey, I'm right in your face, brutal kind of person, where Death is much more agile kind of fighter. And now you have uh, Fury as a much more uh, uh, different style. And so when you add that type of different protagonist, there's going to be uh, those challenges of how you still stay in that same world, but explore a different challenge for the player to, to, to introduce and have some fun with. I feel like uh, every Darksiders game needs to be its own thing. I definitely think like uh, as Darksiders 1, or Darksiders 2 was different than 1, 3 is different than 2 or 1, um, but there's definitely elements that carry over from those. It is funny to hear um, you know, fans' reactions like, make it just like Darksiders 1, make it just like Darksiders 2, and it's like, I, that doesn't seem interesting to me. It's definitely like, let's do some new stuff. I think like, uh, I think people will be very happy with the, the things that we bring back, but also with some of the new stuff. So. Um, I think it's kind of important to help also establish because it's unlike a traditional sequel, you're playing as this different character. You're not playing Kratos every time, or you're not playing uh, Dante uh, with every Darksiders game. You're playing War, then Death, then Fury. So it, it, I feel like that's one of the key elements of, of, uh, of, those game, of our games is that they need to play differently. They need to feel like unique characters. I love world building. I love. I, I mean, I like making bosses. I make a lot of bosses. And I like making creatures, but you know, I've always said in the past that like the biggest, most complete and interesting character in any Dark Souls game is the world itself, like, and how it interconnects and all the different elements. And so, for me, I just the, we've structured the world differently. It's more organic. It's less hub and spoke. And I love the intricacy of how worlds like that can connect together. And I like that sense where you've been exploring for like an hour, and then you plop out into a room, and you're like, wait. I was in this room an hour ago, but I was down there, and now I'm up here, and I can do this. And you, you start to get that mental image of how it all interconnects, and it, and it, it's it's a really cool moment because you finally realize that like, hey, there's actually this almost grand clockwork design to how everything's connected, and it's really exciting to build that and design that. And I think it's, I find it personally really exciting to play that when I play that in other games. Outside of just you know everything is a little bit smaller, concise, and you have to you know I think that you know um, for us. The story doesn't change, you know, the, the beats that we want to hit, the gameplay is a little bit different, but outside of that, uh, you know, it's just a little bit smaller of a title because it just, you know, you just don't have, you know, hundreds of people working on it or the, the budget, you know, necessarily. But I think that it's still going to be quite compelling. I think that uh, it goes back, you know, Darksiders 2 was bigger than Darksiders 1, um, but it's still, I think you can make a 
a lot of game for, for what we're, we're doing and I think that's the exciting part and the visuals you know, will all be there and the things that we enjoy about the franchise will all be there and, and THQ Nordic has been a great partner I think you know with working with those guys they are they're certainly you know super fans of the original title and want to stay you know to that and as true as they can you know and, and still run a business and so it's been really a nice partnership for us as well. Meeting fans expectations is always going to be difficult because um, I, I, everybody like some people came into one and they loved it. They didn't like things we did in two. Some people came in at two and, and didn't like one. So it, it's like it's really hard to just know exactly where people people land on that. I think um, my perception is I think the, the core tenets of the Darksiders series are the world, the characters and lore, and the combat. And I think as long as those are good, I think people will be happy with it. Um, and, I'm, and I'm feeling like uh, Darksiders 3 is definitely on the right track for that stuff. So I think all three of those are, are in line. With the fans, that's always going to be a, a challenge and you, you hope that you, uh, you excite and, 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 and those people, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much a vocal minority that are out there that are, are willing to either say great things or, or negative things about the game. But, uh, you know, you, you try to uh, hit that, those marks and then hopefully the people that are really just out there in between there, someone enjoy it and say, hey, this was a great title. We're really, really having a lot of fun with it. Uh, three's shaping up really well to be my favorite, but I don't know. I just I put so much personal time in on Darksiders One that it was a labor of love, and it was definitely like I still like look back on that with with, the, with tears in my eyes of like the blood, sweat, and tears put into it at the time, and then like the nostalgia of like man, that was that was a time that was unlike any other time I've ever had in the game industry. It was one of those things where for the longest time you just didn't see the end of the tunnel, like. Like literally for years, you did not see the end of the tunnel. And then suddenly, when you had that moment when you saw the light and you're like, wow, we're going to finish this game and it's actually really cool, like it's a really good feeling. Like, and, and I think that's probably some weird human masochist thing where like the more you struggle with something, the better it feels when you overcome it. <laughs> um, so I don't think we could possibly struggle harder on a Dark Souls game than we did on the first one. So that it just endemically becomes the most fulfilling of the three. My favorite part of working on Fire is that all the projects we were making are cool. Like they're fun, they're games I would play. And not everybody gets to do that. Um, you know, there's a lot of studios out there that just make certain types of games or like they'll have a couple projects that are interesting and they'll be doing some other stuff that's not. And, and there are, I mean, there are still studios that just do really cool stuff. I think for me, it's a little extra special because A, we're small. Uh, and I feel like everybody here has a lot of access to um, anybody in the studio, they can come talk to me whenever they want. There's not like a hard, large corporate structure. And uh, and there's a lot of cool stuff we're doing and it's more than one project. Like if you get bored of something, it's not a problem. We can just move you on to something else or you could switch to another project. And uh, there's just a lot of room here, I think, for people to express and be creative. And, and it, it's funny because I don't think people always realize that, like when you work in a smaller studio. And we've had a lot of people over the years not necessarily gunfire, but even at Vigil, because even though Vigil was big, it was kind of run the same way. Like, I always try to make the studios to where, hey, this is a small studio mindset. Like, I'm not gonna just sit in my office like some corporate overlord and pass down edicts. Now, it probably annoys them that I don't do that. They probably, in some cases, would prefer me to do that because it probably annoys them when I come out and I'm like, oh, that's retarded, why'd you do that? Or that's dumb, or don't do that, or that's silly. Um, and th they probably find that annoying, but I think there's a certain amount of, um, perks to having that kind of access and, and knowing that everything's more open and then you can communicate and you know the people have gone away and like and come back and said wow I really missed that like I went somewhere else and it was like super corporate like I couldn't I could talk to my lead and nobody else and uh, and I think that's a really unique aspect of the studio and the studio culture and hopefully we can maintain that over time we'll see. I hope the future of Gunfire Games is that at some point we are building our own IPs and publishing our own IPs that's kind of where we want to get. That doesn't preclude the possibility that we're working with a publisher, the co publisher an IP, but I think that, and this is probably the dream of every independent studio, every game creator, is that you want to get to the point where you kind of get to call your own shots. And it's kind of a weird thing to say because sometimes outside influence is a good thing. Like, some, as much as everybody complains about publishers, sometimes they say things that make sense. And sometimes you need someone to just smack you on the back of the head and say, you're being dumb or you're not seeing the full picture. But, I think for me, having control of your own destiny means that you're not you're not in a situation, and this happens a lot in the game industry, where like you live or die by something. Like you you are in full control. If I die, I died because I failed. 
not because someone else failed. And that's really where I want to get to. I'm gonna get video. Oh, you're gonna get the video? Yeah. Oh, really? It's very important. Okay. I'll <laughs> I just figured I'd warn you. Yeah. Um. So you you want to get that? Yeah. If we'll, we're gonna clear everything before we post it, so. If something needs to be blurred out, we'll blur it out. This is like B-roll game developer work. Yeah, exactly. Take one. <laughs> no, no. cameras around. So sorry, man. No, it's Hey, I did. That's one of the things I actually hate about just coming into a studio and going. It's like. You really get a chance to introduce yourself to everyone and be like, "Hey, I'm gonna be really awkward around you yeah, for I'm for three days." I'm just